Hello everyone. I'd like to discuss a topic that I've thought about a lot over the past few years. The topic is the reactionless drive. A reactionless drive is a spacecraft engine that produces thrust without any exhaust. Now you probably know how a conventional rocket or spacecraft engine works. The spacecraft shoots something out of the back, for example, the exhaust gas from burning fuel. The exhaust carries momentum to the left, and the spacecraft gains momentum to the right. The idea of a reactionless drive is that there is no exhaust, nothing to carry momentum to the left, but the spacecraft is still able to produce thrust and gain momentum to the right, presumably due to some complicated internal process. It turns out there's a long history of proposals for reactionless drives. In the 1950s, Norman Dean created what is now called the Dean Drive. That was followed in the 70s, 80s, and 90s by proposals for various forms of gyroscopic inertial thrusters, or GIT. These drives supposedly convert internal gyroscopic motion into linear motion. Some of the more famous examples include Robert Cook's CIP engine and the propulsion system designed by the well-known inventor Eric Lathwaite. In 2001, Robert Shawyer proposed the EM drive, and that was followed by the Canet drive in 2014, created by Guido Feta. The idea behind these drives is to use electromagnetic radiation in a closed resonant cavity to produce thrust. The most recent example of a reactionless drive is a proposal by David M. Burns called the helical engine. What makes this proposal especially interesting is that David Burns is a NASA engineer. I have a lot of respect for the engineers and scientists who work for NASA, so when a proposal like this comes from NASA, it deserves a close look. To be fair, the helical engine is not a NASA project. Dr. Burns developed the idea in his spare time, not as a part of his NASA duties. Nevertheless, the proposal was written up in a NASA technical report in 2019, and you can find it on the NASA website. Before I focus on the helical engine, let me make a statement that applies to all of these proposals for a reactionless drive. They won't work. The Dean drive, get thrusters, EM drives, the helical engine, and so on. None of them will work. The reason is that they violate a basic law of physics, namely the law of conservation of momentum. This law says that an isolated system with no momentum can't acquire momentum on its own. So a rocket ship in outer space with no momentum can't just gain momentum by somehow wiggling or thrashing about or bouncing around electromagnetic waves. No internal mechanism can produce thrust. Here's a spacecraft with a complicated internal mechanism. What you're seeing is an actual simulation using Newtonian physics. Of course, the internal motion fails to produce any thrust, and the spacecraft doesn't go anywhere. To work, a spacecraft engine must eject something like exhaust or electromagnetic radiation. In that case, the system as a whole, the spacecraft plus exhaust or radiation, conserves momentum, but the spacecraft itself can gain momentum to the right at the expense of exhaust gases or radiation gaining momentum to the left. This argument that reactionless drives can't work because they violate conservation of momentum has been pointed out by a lot of people, and the argument is completely definitive in the eyes of any reasonable physicist. So why do so many non-physicists seem to dismiss this argument? I wonder if the issue stems from our cavalier use of the word law in everyday language. For example, we often see claims that some new scientific research breaks the laws of physics. Maybe we've become comfortable with the notion that the laws of physics can be violated. So what kind of law is conservation of momentum? Is it like the law that says you can't drive above the speed limit? In other words, is it a rule that we're expected to follow, but we don't really have to if we don't want to? No, conservation of momentum isn't like that. Is conservation of momentum a law in the sense that it's something we've always observed to be true in the past? No, it's not like that. Of course, we have observed conservation of momentum to hold in countless experiments over many hundreds of years. But the law of conservation of momentum has a much deeper foundation. It arises from the basic assertion that there is no fundamental difference between one spatial location and another. This deeper foundation was first discovered by the mathematician Emmy Nerder in 1918. What she realized was the basic relationship between symmetries and conservation laws, now known as Nerder's theorem. 
In particular, conservation of momentum stems from a symmetry that we call spatial translation invariance. This says that the behavior of an isolated system will be independent of its spatial location. This is why I can write a physics book in North America and sell it in Australia. Our physical theories apply equally well in any spatial location. What Nerder showed was that this symmetry of nature implies conservation of momentum. Not only is the behavior of an isolated system insensitive to its spatial location, it's also insensitive to its location in time. It will behave the same tomorrow as it does today. This symmetry is referred to as time translation invariance, and Nerder's theorem tells us that, as a consequence, energy is conserved. So conservation of momentum and conservation of energy are deeply rooted in the foundations of human experience. More to the point, all of the physics theories that Dr. Burns uses to justify his helical engine design respect these symmetries, and they obey these conservation laws. It simply is not possible to design an engine based on these theories and have the resulting device fail to conserve momentum. Now, so far I've only given you words, and I would love to show you the math. Unfortunately, a general proof of Nerder's theorem is somewhat complicated. It relies on advanced topics such as Lagrangian mechanics and field theory. I'll save that for another video. For now, I want to focus on the helical engine and show you where David Burns makes his mistake. Here's how the helical engine is supposed to work. Ions are accelerated to high speeds by electric fields and kept moving in a helical path by magnetic fields. The ions move in a cylindrical chamber with the axis along the z-direction. The ions reflect back and forth between the ends of the cylinder, always following a helical path. When an ion reflects from an end of the cylinder, it imparts some momentum. When it reflects off the plus end, it imparts momentum in the positive z-direction. When it reflects off the minus end, it imparts momentum in the negative z-direction. For the helical drive to work, to produce a net thrust in the positive z-direction, the ions must have greater momentum when they hit the plus end of the cylinder compared to the minus end. Burns proposes to exploit special relativistic effects to increase the momenta of the ions as they move towards the plus end of the cylinder and decrease the ions' momenta as they move towards the minus end. Let T, X, Y, and Z denote Minkowski coordinates for some inertial frame in special relativity. Also let M denote the rest mass of an ion, and note that M is a constant. It only depends on the type of ion. It's not the varying relativistic mass that is sometimes used in older treatments of special relativity. Now, the velocity of an ion, as measured in the inertial frame, is the time derivative of x vector, where x vector is the vector of spatial coordinates. The momentum of the ion is denoted p vector and is equal to the product of gamma, m, and the velocity vector. The relativistic gamma factor is defined by 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, where v is the magnitude of the velocity. In particular, the z component of momentum is gamma times m times the z component of velocity. Evidently, we can increase the z component of momentum in two ways. One way is to exert a force on the ion in the z direction, but this would result in a back reaction on whatever mechanism is exerting the force. In other words, the ion would gain momentum in one direction, but the force-producing mechanism would gain momentum in the opposite direction, nullifying any net change in momentum for the system as a whole. This isn't what we want. The second way to increase the ion's z component of momentum is to increase the components of the ion's velocity in directions transverse to the z-axis. That is, increase the x or y components of velocity. This increases the speed v and consequently increases the gamma factor. Since the forces are being exerted in the x and y directions, there is no back reaction along the z direction. Of course, there will be a back reaction in the x or y directions, but that can be compensated in various ways, for example, by using two counter-rotating beams of ions. So with this mechanism, it appears that we can increase the z component of the ion's momentum for free. The ion then imparts its enhanced momentum on the plus end of the cylinder. And to complete the cycle, the ion is slowed down by transverse forces as it moves in the negative z direction, so the momentum it imparts at the minus end of the cylinder is relatively small. That's how the helical engine is supposed to work. You can see the key points in these excerpts from the NASA technical report.
Each ion transfers the z-axis component of its momentum to the right side and then the left side of the engine. Thrust is created because the two momentum transfers are not balanced. The proposed engine attempts to create the momentum difference in these collisions by first accelerating and then decelerating the ions. The beam guide is designed to hold the ion's z-axis component of velocity constant while its absolute velocity is increased or decreased as needed. The engine changes the momentum of ions by increasing and decreasing their rotational velocity around the z-axis, which is parallel to the engine's direction of travel. This allows the ion's absolute velocity to be altered without imparting force along the engine's direction of travel. Let me summarize. Burns proposes to increase the ion speed v while keeping the z component of velocity constant. But if you actually look at the equations, it doesn't work. The relativistic version of Newton's second law is f vector equals the time derivative of the momentum vector, where f vector is the relativistic three force and as before, p vector is gamma times m times the velocity vector. In the case of the helical engine, the force is supplied by electric and magnetic fields. Note that none of these basic equations are in dispute. They're exactly as written in the NASA technical report. Let's start the analysis with a side calculation by taking the dot product of Newton's second law with the velocity, and then expand the derivative. The first term can be written as mv squared times the derivative of gamma, where v squared is the dot product of the vector v with itself. The second term can be written as one half m gamma times the derivative of v squared. Now note that from the definition of the gamma factor, we find that v squared is c squared times one minus one over gamma squared. Inserting this into the right hand side gives the following expression for f dot v which simplifies to mc squared times the time derivative of gamma. We can rearrange this result to show that the time derivative of the gamma factor equals 1 over mc squared times the dot product of the force and the velocity. Let's set that result aside and return to the relativistic version of Newton's second law. Expand the derivative, use our previous result for the time derivative of gamma, and then solve for the time derivative of the velocity. This is, of course, the acceleration vector. Note that in the limit that the ion speed v is much less than the speed of light c, this result reduces to the non-relativistic version of Newton's second law, namely, acceleration equals force over mass. In the non-relativistic case, the acceleration is proportional to the force. But in the relativistic case, this is no longer true. The acceleration is not simply proportional to the force. Let's write out the z component of our equation for the acceleration, and in the process, set the z component of force equal to zero. Remember, by setting f sub z equal to zero, we ensure that there is no z component to the back reaction on the force producing mechanism. This is the result, where f dot v equals f sub x times v sub x plus f sub y times v sub y. If the forces in the x and y directions do positive work, so that f dot v is greater than zero, and the ions are moving to the right, so that v sub z is greater than zero, then the z component of the velocity must decrease in time. As we saw before, the rate of change of gamma is one over mc squared times f dot v, so when f dot v is positive, the gamma factor must increase. The net result is that v sub z decreases as gamma increases, so that the z component of momentum is constant in time. This result, that the z component of momentum is constant, is precisely what Newton's second law is telling us. Taking the z component and setting f sub z equal to zero, we find that the time derivative of gamma times m times v sub z vanishes. So when there is no z component of force, the gamma factor and the z component of velocity must each change in such a way that the z component of momentum remains constant. To summarize, the z component of an ion's momentum cannot be increased or decreased by exerting forces in the x and y directions. The analysis of the helical engine given in the NASA technical report is incorrect. The error is probably a common one, 
mixing results from Newtonian physics and special relativity in an inconsistent manner. David Burns assumed that, as in Newtonian physics, forces in the x and y directions don't affect the z component of velocity, but in relativity this isn't true. So the helical engine won't work. As for the other reactionless drive proposals, like get thrusters and EM drives, we can show that they won't work either. And note that making the proposed mechanism more complicated by adding electromagnetic fields or quantum processes won't change the conclusion, because the fundamental laws of electromagnetism and quantum mechanics, like special relativity and Newtonian mechanics, are invariant under space and time translations. In other words, they conserve momentum and energy. What really amazes me is that some of these reactionless drives have actually been built and tested, and of course they don't work. But that doesn't seem to deter people from continuing to spend time, money, and resources trying to build a device that violates the laws of physics. As always, thanks for watching.